Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray once more. <clears throat> o Son of Man, will you bless us now with your presence? Will you glorify your grace, O Lord, in our midst? Heavenly Father, will you show us your goodness and your kindness? Will you teach us again some of the blessings that we know in and from you alone? Will you show us your heart and draw our hearts toward you, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. I think the story of Christ's encounter with Zacchaeus is one of Luke's high points. It's uh, an episode that I would like to preach from every angle. It's one of those that just seems to bubble over with good things, some more obvious lying on the surface, some more incidental or tangential that you can pick up good things along the lines. But I'm trying to cover it in one go, and we will attempt to do that, God helping us. It's a history in which we see the power of God in operation. If you go back to chapter 18 and verse 24, you will remember that the Lord Jesus said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. But verse 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. We've seen a rich ruler who couldn't let go of his wealth. But now we see a rich tax collector in whom God will be powerfully at work. And it's important, again, to see how Luke is arranging some of this material, the, the connections, the echoes, the contrast, the comparisons, and the lessons. You've had a blind man who could see clearly with eyes of faith. Now you've got a rich man with exemplary repenting, faith and repentance, Seeing and believing, trusting and repenting, here is salvation being set before us in these beautiful figures. Here are examples for Theophilus and for us. Remember that man to whom Luke is uh, framing his narrative, to remember the things which have been delivered to us, to get a grasp on the things which we've been taught now remember that Christ has been going through Jericho and there's a, a double Jericho if you remember. There's the old and the new town and Jericho is on a major trade route on the way up to Jerusalem which helps to explain the richness of Zacchaeus. We're going to see first of all a little man, then the gracious Christ, then a happy response from the little man to a gracious Christ. Then there's a vicious complaint that we need to take account of. We'll consider manifest or evident, open and demonstrable repentance, and then a glorious testimony. And that is the short version, and we'll get as far as we can. We'll start then with a little man. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. 
And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. What do we know about this man? We know his name. His name is Zacchaeus. It means basically pure or righteous, which might have meant that people talked about Zacchaeus with an ironic sneer on their faces. We know his occupation. He is a chief tax collector, not one of your ordinary tax collectors. He's at the top of the tree and he's there in the middle of this tax region in the center of it at Jericho so that all the revenues from all the other tax collectors are flowing in to Jericho and through the hands of Zacchaeus. Now in connection with that you know because we've said it before in Luke and elsewhere that the tax collectors are already by definition a despised class. They are Jews who are working for the Romans. They are traitors nationally. They're also uh, typically then ending up on the outskirts of society with the other sinners. And in verse 7, it's quite clear that Zacchaeus is not an exception to the tax collector rule. He has gone, they say of Jesus, to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. You can hear them spitting it out, can't you? A man who is a sinner. Verse 8, Zacchaeus, look, Lord, if I, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now, that's not the if of possibility. That's the if of I've got to do something about this. It's not the kind of repentance. Well, if I've offended somebody, if I've done anything wrong, I'll, I'm sure I'll sort it out. It's because these are the things that have happened, I've got some business to do. If that's the case, I need to put it right. And so it seems that Zacchaeus may be typically dishonest and typically despised. But being dishonest, even when you are despised, can at least line your pockets. We hear about his wealth. He is a rich man. We've already quoted from chapter 18 that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's got a hundred reasons to keep a grip upon the things of this world. And so now you've got a counterpoint. You, you should be thinking, wait a minute, this is going to be hard. You've got a tax collector and he's very wealthy. But he's also got an interesting desire. He wanted to see who Jesus was. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? He wanted to see who Jesus was. There's at least some level of curiosity about the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Maybe even a measure of appetite. He sought to see him. He wants to set eyes on this person. Now, I can imagine that uh, a group such as the tax collectors, birds of a feather flock together, maybe Zacchaeus has already heard that there's a man named Jesus of Nazareth who eats with sinners. Maybe he's already heard of some of the other tax collectors who have turned from their, uh, if not from their, uh, their work at least from their sin and who have become followers of the Lord Jesus we don't actually know where Zacchaeus heard enough to say I need to see this man but it's not just he wants to see who's in the crowd he wanted to see who Jesus was and I suggest to you brothers and sisters again this is perhaps a little incidental that there's an encouragement to you and me in the fact that a man like Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. Don't we typically perhaps assume that no one wants to know about Jesus, that no one cares, that there's this kind of uh, immediate resentment, and perhaps with good reason, because we do often come up against some of that. But here's a Zacchaeus, and he wants to see who Jesus is. Let's not draw the conclusion that no one ever wants to know anything about Jesus. You may have a friend, you may have a neighbour, you may have a colleague who wants to know who Jesus is. And you've never given them the opportunity to ask you or never offered to them the chance to find out. Now, you may get knocked back 99 times out of 100. 
But perhaps there is someone that you know who wants to see who Jesus is. There's a measure of curiosity. Perhaps there's a bit of history. Perhaps there's a family member or a friend who got religious and they're still not sure. And you're the other religious person that they're in contact with. Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. Let's remember that there may even then be a measure of curiosity or appetite under God that there is in the hearts of people that you might have thought would be the last people to be interested. So Zacchaeus, we know his name, we know his occupation, we know his wealth, we know his desire, we know his height. Not in feet and inches, but he was short. He was a little man. He was of short stature. He's short enough that in an average crowd, he can't see what's going on. And some of you boys and girls, perhaps you know what that's like when there's a big group of people and they're all looking in one direction and you trying to find your way around. Well, Zacchaeus is short enough as a man that he's in the same kind of position. He just can't see what's going on. And you see his zeal. He runs and he climbs. Now, it may be that because he's a tax collector and dishonest and despised, that he's not got much dignity left to lose. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have seen a grown man sprinting along the side of the street, let alone climbing a tree. Or it may be that this is how he's trying to retain a shred of dignity. Boys and girls, this is what you would call a good climbing tree, this sycamore tree. It spreads out wide with branches that are nice and low to the ground. If you were walking through the park, you'd say, oh, that's one I want to climb. It's one I can get into. You know, Zacchaeus is a short man. If the branches are too high, he's not getting anywhere. This is a short, uh, a tree that a short man can get into, climb into, and perhaps even be hidden by the leaves. There's no indication here that Zacchaeus necessarily wants to be seen. He's there to look. So perhaps you imagine him climbing up into the lower branches, making his way into a higher perch, and looking out through the leaves where he can see Jesus of Nazareth passing by, but perhaps no one else can see that he is there. It seems then that Zacchaeus, like the rich ruler, is fundamentally dissatisfied with everything that he has so far received. He's a very rich man. He's at the top of the tree with regard to his profession. But no one or very few people seem to like him very much. And he still wants to find out who Jesus of Nazareth is. He is a lost man. He's like that sheep. He's like that coin. He's like that son. He doesn't belong socially, religiously, personally. He's a little man. And then there is a gracious Christ. I want you to love it the way this story unfolds. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. Notice the pity of the Lord Jesus in dealing with Zacchaeus. He stops and he looks up now, how many of you look up when you're out for a walk? I mean, sometimes you might say, have the leaves come down, or perhaps you take one of those lovely pictures looking up through the branches of a tree. But most of us don't stop and look up very often, but the Lord Jesus Christ does. And I think there's even something lovely about the idea that the incarnate Son of God looks up at a sinner. And he calls him down. There's a little echo here. Do you remember the blind man? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Lord Christ stopped. And in the hustle and bustle of a crowd that would disorient and jostle a blind man, he said, bring him to me. He called him over. And he stops for this rich man too, this poor rich man. He looks up to him where he is there, clinging on to the branches of this tree. And he doesn't pass by. He now takes the initiative to do more than have a, a sort of a distant relationship of curiosity or vague interest. 
there's pity in the way that Jesus deals with Zacchaeus and there's precision there may be a hint here that Jesus makes his way to the tree where Zacchaeus is if that doesn't persuade you he looked up he set eyes on him and he said Zacchaeus there's no doubt now I mean maybe Zacchaeus thinks he's well hidden maybe it's just a little pair of eyes poking out between the leaves Zacchaeus come down quickly make haste and come down I must stay today in your house now friends how would you respond if someone just walked up and said that to you there's regal authority here and it's delivered with precision to the little man who's hiding in the big sycamore tree Zacchaeus make haste come down fixes his eye upon him calls him by name direct dealings and then that power he gives him these royal commands how would you deal how do you deal with Zacchaeus type people I'm not suggesting that it's quite at the stage where when Zacchaeus walks down the street the mothers call their children in and lock the doors so that his shadow doesn't fall upon them but maybe Zacchaeus is the kind of man of whom a good Jewish mother would say I don't want my children playing with his children maybe he's the kind of man that if you saw him in Sainsbury's you'd take a different aisle that if you were walking down the street you'd cross over so you didn't have to deal with him that if he were in trouble you wouldn't want anybody to know that you knew because then you could get away with not having to do anything to help him out he's not a man you want dealings with not a man you want personal contact with not a man that many good people would be engaged with very quickly or easily I think you probably know people like Zacchaeus families that you wouldn't want to taint your family neighbours that you'd rather not have too much to deal with colleagues who are vulgar or have spiritual bad habits people that you draw back from that you steer clear of and perhaps all other good right thinking people do the same kind of thing when the Lord Jesus found Zacchaeus he spoke to him he looked on him with pitying love he showed him compassion let's not underestimate what it may mean for somebody who knows that they're on the outskirts to be spoken to with this kind of personal address with kindness with compassion with dignity that you know their name and that you care about them not necessarily saying you go up to them and say I'm coming back to your house this evening but do you have anything of Christ-like compassion toward those who are in need or perhaps Christ is speaking to you and you don't need to be a little man in a sycamore tree you don't need to be a chief tax collector you don't need to be on the outskirts and the off scourings of society because this is how the Lord Jesus deals with sinning souls like mine and yours he speaks with pity with precision and with power if you want an example of what we call technically an effectual call you've kind of got it here in the language that the Lord Jesus speaks to Zacchaeus hurry up come down I must come in today and Zacchaeus responds have you heard the voice of Jesus does he speak to you those of you who are older those of you who are younger some of you who perhaps want to know who Jesus is some of you perhaps who couldn't care less who Jesus really is but Christ speaks he speaks in his word how wonderful it would be if in the echoes of Jesus speech to Zacchaeus this morning somebody heard Christ speaking to you hurry up very quickly come down do you feel the force of his authority have you 
as you've listened to these sermons on Luke or perhaps read the Bible for yourself or heard about this Jesus in family worship? Have you come to understand something of his dignity as the Son of God come in the flesh? The fact that he can say to you, I want to have dealings with you today. It's a little man hiding in a tree. And there's a gracious Christ who makes his way to the spot, fixes his eyes on that little man and speaks with pity and with power to his soul. And there is a happy response, verse 6. You get the echo? Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And there's those key four verbs there. He made haste, he came down, he received him, he rejoiced. I, th I thought I might just preach that text. This is what salvation looks like. Don't be surprised if at some point in the future, Luke chapter 19, verse 6, here is a picture of salvation. Christ calls him and he responds. There's no delay in coming humbly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here now is the joy of salvation. And it's tragic, isn't it, how rare this has been in Luke along the way. Luke loves to draw attention to the joy that Jesus brings to the hearts of those who trust in him. Do you remember how he recorded the declaration of the angels there on the hills above Jerusalem? The angels said to them, do not be afraid, for look, I bring you good news of what? Of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord. We've had the first man who identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the son of David. And now you've got a man who's feeling great joy because he's hearing this good news. He's seeing the one who brings salvation to sinners. Or again in chapter 15, verses 6 and 7. The man who had gone to find the lost sheep, and when he comes back, he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Are you surprised that the Zacchaeus is glad? Does it seem odd to you that a sinner should rejoice because salvation has come to his soul? My friends, salvation makes us happy. It doesn't give us the, the kind of careless and shallow joy of the world. It makes us deeply satisfied and spiritually delighted in what God has done for our souls. It changes the whole demeanour. And I've seen it happen. Perhaps the most striking instance that I can recall. There was somebody who was sitting, oh, I'm not going to, well, yes, between Sam and Bill. And sitting there on a Sunday morning, they had a face like thunder. They were hunched over, arms folded, head down, hair hanging. <coughs> just looking, not even angry on that day, just sad, just distressed, miserable. They sat in a different chair in the evening, not too far along the road. Shoulders were back, head was up, hair was away from the face, eyes were clear, face was calm. Not like a weird look but just peace there was joy what had occurred between Sunday morning and Sunday evening Christ had said make haste come down I'm coming in and that person had made haste they'd come down Christ had been received and there was joy in the heart You may not have the misery pouring out of your face, but it may be building up in your soul. If you're a Christian, you have found joy. You have found good news of great joy. 
a joy that's like a cork in stormy waters. It will bob back to the surface no matter how heavy the waves may be. A solid joy and a lasting treasure which none but Zion's children know. Zacchaeus has become a happy man. Perhaps before he was a sour man, a mean man, a miserly man. The indications are there. Now his shoulders are back. His face has changed. There's peace in his soul. And there's a full embrace of Jesus Christ. He received him joyfully. He held nothing back. His heart and his home are entirely at the Lord's disposal. He is loving the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength now and his neighbour as himself. It's wonderful, isn't it? From the moment Christ looked up into the tree, between there and the moment Zacchaeus, his feet touched the dust at the bottom. His relationship with God had changed entirely. A joy flooded his heart as he received the Son of God as his Saviour. Doesn't that make verse 7 all the more distressing? The vicious complaint. Zacchaeus runs home with a smile on his face in order to prepare a feast for Jesus of Nazareth because he has seen him for who he is. But when they saw it, you know who they are now, don't you? When the Pharisees saw it, when they saw it, they all complained. Here's the characteristic spirit of legal religion. He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. We've been here before when lost people are found. Chapter 15 and verse 2. All the tax collectors and the sinners are drawn near to Christ to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complain, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You know what they're complaining about, don't you? They're complaining about God's mercy. They're resentful of divine grace. Fellowship with a sinner. God himself is smiling. The angels are singing and the Pharisees are sniping. This Jesus doesn't know the difference between a good man and a bad one. Can't tell the difference between right and wrong, this Nazarene. Well, what do you expect coming from there? Here he is, eating and drinking with a sinner. We know what kind of man Zacchaeus is, doesn't he? If he were any kind of rabbi... If he were any kind of religious man, he'd be drawing back from him. He'd be saying, don't have anything to do with him. He'd be crossing over the street so that he might not have to deal with him. But Jesus came to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, more than over 99 just people, at least in their own eyes, who need no repentance. Brothers and sisters, do you want this congregation to grow? Are you ready for a Zacchaeus or two? When he comes in, will you draw back or will you reach out? You may be very rich, That might make a few of you a little more inclined towards him. He may be poor and skanky and you might want to have nothing to do with him. But whether he be rich or poor, whether he be high or low in the estimation of men, do we not preach the gospel to every creature? Where is our compassion? Where is our pity? Are we ready to welcome all and any who are coming to Jesus Christ and to invest in the last, in the least, and in the lost? It will take time. When a congregation grows, the congregation needs to invest in those who are coming in. The elders need to care for the lambs of the flock. 
There are people who perhaps know almost nothing about the Lord Jesus. They're learning things for the first time. There's a division of labour. There's a readiness to pour ourselves into what? The outsiders? The strangers? The newcomers? Who are these people coming in here messing up our church? Can you imagine that being said of a Zacchaeus? I don't have to imagine it. I have seen churches crippled by this. Praying that people would be converted and then distinctly unhappy with the people who God chooses to convert. And perhaps you are here this morning saying, I could and should have been one of them. And yet God chose you. And God's people embraced you and loved you and taught you. Would it not be a tragedy if we replicated the spirit of the Pharisees in this congregation and became suspicious of grace? I'm not sure God saves people like him. Isn't he precisely the kind of person that God does save? A sinner like me and like you? Or resentful of the investment that is made in those who are otherwise cast out and needy? Those who've come hungry and thirsty, seeking after righteousness or do we rejoice with God and his angels because those who are outside have been brought in and those who are lost have been found there's a manifest repentance you know the, the proverb we have the proof of the pudding is in the eating Zacchaeus has just been called a sinner Christ is being derided and disdained because he can't tell the difference between a wretched man like Zacchaeus and a fine upstanding citizen like, well, for example, the people who are calling Zacchaeus a sinner. Do you notice that Zacchaeus doesn't pretend that he was a good man all along? Zacchaeus doesn't try and hide his sin, doesn't draw a veil over his past life. Perhaps there were things that he'd said and done that he, he wouldn't have broadcast to the world. By all means, that would be sensible. But Zacchaeus does say, hang on, hang on a minute, I'm not a sinner. I mean, I may have, you know, snaffled a little bit here or there. I may have rounded up rather than down when I should have rounded down rather than up. But, yeah, I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I mean, I'm, I'm not a bad husband. I'm, I'm a pretty good father. I've been a, a reasonable citizen. After all, I'm responsible for a measure of employment here in Jericho. I spend my money in the town. What are you calling me a sinner for? Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Zacchaeus says, in effect, yes, I am a sinner. But I have had a change of heart. And I have a change of life. You need to understand that this isn't Zacchaeus paying in order that God might accept him. This is Zacchaeus showing that God has accepted him. This is a heart that has been changed by the grace of God. This is a man whose entire existence has been reversed. And you notice now the contrast. The rich ruler, what did he do? He went away sad when Christ challenged him with regard to his attachment to his wealth because he was very rich. Christ does not challenge Zacchaeus as far as we can tell. The Lord hasn't needed to put his finger on this part of Zacchaeus' heart because Zacchaeus' heart has been changed by grace. And it's evident to all that wealth is no longer Zacchaeus' God, that money no longer reigns on the throne of his soul. This is a man who has been delivered from sin. And how now will Zacchaeus serve the God who has saved him? He's going to give half of his wealth to the poor. You understand now then that when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, I want you to give everything you've got to the poor, that that was a test case. He doesn't turn around and say to Zacchaeus, ah, you see, your heart's only half changed because you're only giving half your money away. No, the point isn't you've got to give everything away. It's a change of attitude. It's a change of heart. God is on the throne of Zacchaeus' soul. And so I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. And 
If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. When I have defrauded anybody, I'm not just going to give it back. And I'm not just going to give it back with the little extra that the law might strictly require of me. See, grace goes beyond law. There's another principle. If you've (coughs) taken someone's ox, you give the ox back and you give another four oxen beside. Zacchaeus says, I'll take that. That's a way I can show my love to God. That's a way I can respond to what Christ has done in me and for me. I'm going to restore fourfold to anybody from whom I have stolen. Again, do you remember the Pharisee in the temple? God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. There he is. He goes out to his garden. He's going to get some mint for the lamb. Gets uh, ten leaves, chops them up, puts them in the weighing scale. There's one leaf's worth. That's how holy I am, folks, when it comes to my mint and my anise and my cumin. I give a tenth of everything to God. And what if God had said, I want everything? What? Have you defrauded any widows, you Pharisee? Have you perhaps said to those who might have been ready to care for their parents, oh no, that money belongs to the temple where we will be very glad to take care of it. There were lots of wealthy Pharisees who'd lined their pockets under a pretense of religion. I think if you'd said to the Pharisee and the tax collector, well, the tithe is all well and good, but has grace opened your heart? Has God's mercy extended your hands? Has the favour of God toward you opened your home to others? Zacchaeus is a changed man. And you can tell because he's living a changed life. And you notice how the change occurs at the very point at which Zacchaeus had been such a prominent sinner. That's the point at which you can see that Zacchaeus' life has changed. The miser becomes a generous man. The grasper becomes a giver. The sour becomes cheerful. The cruel becomes kind. The vicious becomes gracious. The angry becomes meek. The bully becomes merciful. My friend, have you considered whether or not there really is a repenting heart beating in your chest? Whether or not there really is a soul that has been changed by the grace of God? Has your idol been toppled and cast out? Or are you still making your excuses for the sins that have characterised you all your days and you're quite happy to call yourself a child of God but you will not have God in your heart and you will be, whether it be miserly or grasping or cruel or vicious or sour or angry or whatever it may be, is your life now a testimony that things have changed from the inside out. Don't call yourself a Christian if you're still living the way you always did. Don't pretend to be following Christ if the idols are still upright and reigning in your soul. You cannot profess to be a Christian and still live like the rich ruler and say, no, God cannot have that. To profess to be in Christ and to live your old life still is a contradiction in terms. And Zacchaeus didn't say, well, hang on a minute, I was, you know, it was just my job or it was the way that God made me or it's how I'm put together or it's, it's just what needed to be done. All the other tax collectors were doing it. You'd have done it in my position, wouldn't you? Zacchaeus acknowledges himself a sinner and he makes reparation. He goes to deal with those issues. And money is still a very good barometer of your soul's health. 
If you want to know what God has done in your heart, my friend, go home and check your budget. Look at how much money comes in and where that money goes out. How much of it is used to serve God and men? Or how much of it do you use solely for yourself? How much of it goes on hospitality to those who are in some kind of need? If they're not hungry and thirsty for food, they're at least hungry and thirsty for fellowship and friendship. How much of it is poured out in grace, in kindness, in goodness? What do you do with the stuff that you've got? Do you need to learn a lesson from Zacchaeus? Perhaps your family budget says, God is not my God. Perhaps your spending of your time or your energy or your money says, no, there is an idol still upon the throne. Who do you need to track down today in order to put things right? I suspect that Zacchaeus probably had a very busy few weeks after the day when Christ looked up into the tree and called him down. There may have been many people in Jericho who got a knock on the door, perhaps from Zacchaeus himself. And he looked them in the eyes and he said, will you forgive me for stealing money from you? Here's what I took. And here's what I consider to be the proper interest. Here's the one bag. And here's the other four bags to make up for what I took away. And when a merchant train passes through Jericho, and I think, oh, here we go again. Zacchaeus is going to take his cut. And they look at the bill when it comes in, their, their tax invoice. That's not what it was last time. No, because Zacchaeus isn't skimming anything anymore. Maybe even some of the other tax collectors start to hate Zacchaeus because they're messed up now because he won't let them steal any longer. And that trade caravan actually goes out richer than it came through the last time because Zacchaeus has given back to them what he unrighteously took. Do you need to make good the sin that you have committed against someone else? Financial? Relational? Do you need to set something right? Or are you going to make your excuses and say, well, I just don't need to deal with that? My friends, do we have anything that we need to sort out before God and with men? Maybe you have a family member that you need to call this afternoon and say, I've not been treating you well. Maybe there's a friend and you've done the dirty on them in some way. And it's time to call them up and set things right. Maybe you've got some business to do when you get to work tomorrow morning. Because if you're a child of God, you cannot keep behaving the way you were behaving. I knew a man once. He heard a sermon about Daniel. And the preacher just used a phrase in passing. Because you know the other satraps went to look for trouble, didn't they? They wanted to see where they could trip Daniel up. And they found out that there was nothing that they could bring against him. And the preacher said he hadn't even taken one paper clip home from the office. And that man had to go home put together all the stuff that he'd accumulated over 10 years of work in the office and take it back again in a big old crate. You've got a neighbour with whom you're at odds and it's you who have become angry or resentful or bitter? Or is there a church member and there's some kind of animosity, some antagonism in your heart towards a brother or a sister, even in this place. If you are a repenter, you have business to do with God and with men today. And Jesus spoke. 
when Jesus saw a man whose heart had been utterly upsided down, or upside down, turned upside down. A man whose life had been reversed. A man whose idols had been toppled. A man whose loves were now the polar opposite of what they'd been before. A man whose life, marked before by miserliness and misery, was now characterised by generosity and joy. The Lord Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. When the Lord Jesus talks about today, he's often talking about kingdom reality. Remember when he was opening the scroll at that passage in Isaiah in the synagogue in Capernaum. Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. There's something of heavenly reality that breaks in when Jesus is present. And so it is here. Today something has happened in heavenly and not just in earthly terms. Today salvation has broken into this man's heart. Today someone has made haste and come down and welcomed the Lord Jesus, not just into their home, but into their very heart. Today all the fullness of divine healing has been made known. Today this life has been restored. Zacchaeus has begun to be what God in intended him to be. Zacchaeus is being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Here is the God who set aside all his glory. Here is the immortal, eternal, ineffable son who has laid aside the, the things that belong to him in the highest place and he has stooped down to earth and walking in the dust on the road from Jericho through Jericho to Jerusalem, he's looked up at this big little sinner and he's called him down. And Zacchaeus says, following him, what has he given? What can I give? What has he done? What can I do? And Christ looks at a man whose heart and whose hand has been open now to God and to men. And he says, ah, he also is a son of Abraham. Now, he's not saying, well, he's a Jew, so I can save him. This is one in the eye for the Pharisees. They're the true sons of Abraham. They're the real inheritors of the tradition. They would have put Zacchaeus on the outside. Well, he may be a Jew by birth. He may be a Jew by blood. He may have been circumcised as an infant, but he's not one of us. Oh, yes, he is, says the Lord Jesus. In fact, he's not one of you. He's a son of Abraham. Do you remember Abraham, who was justified by faith without works? A man who, according to James, then showed his faith by his works? Again, this is not the payment that Zacchaeus makes to be saved. This is the proof that Zacchaeus has been saved. And in it, he shows himself a true spiritual descendant of Abraham. Zacchaeus is a Jew indeed. Like his spiritual forefather, he is a rich man justified by faith, revealed in his works. And he has nothing to boast of because this is the grace of God toward him. There's a consistency, always a consistency between the heart and the hand of a saved sinner. Between the mouth and the heart of a saved sinner, between the foot and the heart, between the ears and the heart, between the eyes and the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the purity of the heart, the eye looks or doesn't. Out of the generosity of the heart, the hand gives. Out of the integrity of the heart, the ear hears. Out of the holiness of the heart, the foot walks. Salvation's been received. Salvation has been displayed. Salvation has come to this house. Why? Because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Doesn't that put in a nutshell so much of what we've been looking at over the last few weeks in Luke's gospel? Don't you find Luke here rising to heights? Perhaps under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he's been thinking, oh, I can't wait until we come to that bit where Jesus says this. We've had the people who've turned their backs upon him. We've had the people who thought they were too good for him or good enough in themselves for God. We've had people who said, if that's what God requires of me, then I'm not interested. But we've had a good shepherd who's been seeking lost sheep. We've had a, a woman who's been seeking a lost coin. We've had a father who's been ready to receive a returning son. And now there's a blind man outside Jericho and he can see that Jesus is the son of David. And here is a Zacchaeus who's been called down from the sycamore tree and has received Christ into his heart and into his home. This is Christ's mission in miniature. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of man, the son of David, the true son of God, the only redeemer of God's elect, the one mediator between God and men, the only saviour you will ever find and the only saviour you will ever need. He came from heaven to seek and to save. Not feeble mercy. I've sought, but I can't save. Not heartless might. I could save, but I can't be bothered to seek. But conquering compassion. Pity joined with power. Has he changed? Is our saviour any different today to who and what he was when he stood in the dust by the tree in Jericho and looked up at a little sinner with a wretched heart, called him down and showed him God's so great salvation. This is the saviour that you need. And this is the Saviour who has come. If the Lord Jesus is calling you, make haste. Come down. Receive him. Rejoice. And live out a life of repenting and believing service. Zacchaeus was a little man who found a great Saviour a glorious salvation. And the same Christ seeks and saves lost sinners still. And the same salvation is held out to us and to all who the Lord our God is calling. Amen.